So thank you, Jessica, for the nice introduction, and thanks to, your, for the, to the organizers for inviting me here, which actually was quite a surprise, because I'm not a neuroinformatician, I'm a biologist by training. So what you can expect me to do in the next 45 minutes is to actually add to your task load. I'm going to try to define the questions that, that, um, uh, that can be asked from genetic and, and imaging data and the, the integration of those and uh, the, the regions where improvement of data analysis and, and data sharing, for example, is still needed. So the, the, the question or the goal of my research, the ultimate goal, is to improve the diagnosis and treatment of patients with psychiatric disorders. And you can start this uh, such research from, from many different angles. We've heard imaging, etc. But a good place to start is also by genetics, because as many of you uh, might be aware, most of the psychiatric disorders that we know are very highly heritable. Take, so for example, ADHD, which is the focus, main focus of my own research, which has a heritability of 76%, meaning that an, in an average patient, about three quarters of the phenotype is explained by genetic factors. And this is quite a lot. So the way we approach uh, our research is by trying to identify the genetic factors that underlie these psychiatric disorders, and on the other hand, also trying to map the biology that, that um, leads from the genetic defect or genetic variation to the disease, to risk uh, for disease. So what I want to show you is um, both sides of the coin. By first going into gene finding in psychiatric disorders, uh, show you what the models are and what the, 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 some of the findings, and then move into pathways from genes to disease with different approaches that we can use here. So while being highly heritable, uh, the genetics of these psychiatric disorders are highly complex, and that has made gene finding very, very difficult. Highly complex meaning that in every patient, or at least in most patients, Many genes act uh, simultaneously. And if you look at different patients, different genes can be involved. And we now think that in many of the psychiatric disorders, we, we, um, we're dealing with involvement of more than 1,000 of our 23,000 genes. And in every of these genes, many different uh, independent genetic variants can be involved in increasing your risk for disease. In addition to the uh, genetic contribution, there's also an environmental contribution, meaning that either environmental factors can act independently on disease risk, or they can interact with genetic factors and increase disease risk in this way. Most research on uh, the genetics of psychiatric disorders has been done on genetic variants that are uh, common in the population, so they are not restricted to the patient population, they also are found in, the healthy, in healthy individuals, and all of them are of individually small effect size. And that is also depicted here, where uh, we're dealing with, with the common variants down here, oh, sorry, common variants down here that are common in the, variation, in the population and have a very low effect size. So the way to find these uh, genetic variations are, uh, is by doing genome-wide association studies, and we've been doing these over the last, let's say, 10 years. What we learned from them is that um, neither of us or none of us can uh, do these studies by themselves. So data sharing in genetics in complex genetics is essential. Only by sharing our data and putting our data together in, in mega-analyses or meta-analyses, we can reach the sample sizes that, that start to make sense. And this is, these are examples of, uh, of the psychiatric GWAS consortium, which is, which is certainly the most successful consortium in the field of psychiatric genetics, where people are, are putting together sample sizes of nearly 30,000 or even more uh, individuals to find genetic factors involved in psychiatric disease. And for schizophrenia, that is, I guess, the, the, the disorder that is most uh, advanced. In the first stage, 
they found seven different loci to be involved. There's now a second paper in press which looked at 21,000 cases and finds 22 independent genome-wide significant uh, loci. And uh, I've heard through the grapevine there's uh, already uh, 35,000 patients now uh, assembled, and this gives you more than 100 independent genome-wide significant loci, with in many of these loci different independent factors contributing to, to increasing disease risk. Well, as I said, my own specialty is ADHD, and there we're not right there yet. <laughs> Even with data sharing in the psychiatric GWAS consortium, we're not yet there. We have uh, five, five, more than 5,000 cases, more than 13,000 controls, but we don't find a single uh, genetic variant yet that can be um, uh, called proven. So what you see here is the way we, we plot these data, where on the x-axis you have the different chromosomes, and on the y-axis you have p-values for single variants being analyzed from these different chromosomes. And um, what, as, uh, well, what we're doing, doing is uh, uh, we analyze more than a million genetic variants independently, so we're doing more than a million tests. That, in, of course, increases multiple testing burden extremely. So if we want to um, accept something as being genome-wide significant, we only do so if it reaches a p-value of five, five times 10 to the minus 8. So that, yeah, makes you humble if you think about the numbers. <laughs> We're now, uh, even for ADHD, we're now doing better. We, I think we've crossed the 10,000 cases line. So we hope we find a single, at least a single variant now being genome-wide significant. Even if we have 35,000 cases, um, our, our analyses, such analyses are still underpowered. So people have been thinking about how to improve power uh, for the studies. And as I said, what is generally done is that we analyze each genetic variant individual, individually. But knowing that there are different genetic variants in different patients at the same, in the same gene contributing, uh, one might think that, that taking a different entity like a gene or even a genetic pathway and asking the question whether these are involved in disease might uh, increase the power of your, your studies. And in my group, we have been doing such studies. Janita Brelten is a PhD student in, in my group who has been working with the data from the International Multicenter ADHD, ADHD Genetics or IMAGE study, uh, in which um, more than 1,000 uh, um, families with at least one ADHD-affected individual were very uh, um, strongly um, uh, phenotyped or phenotyped in a very deep manner for ADHD-related phenotypes. So what she did was that she took um, well-established genetic pathways for uh, ADHD, like the dom dopamine pathway, the serotonin pathway, and also a pathway that we found to be involved and in that I will come back to later, the neurad outgrowth pathway. And she asked the question whether these together are involved in uh, increasing your risk for ADHD. In addition to, to um, uh, taking the genes together, she didn't look at, as, uh, at ADHD as a, um, as a category, but she disassembled ADHD into inattentive symptoms and hyperactive symptoms. And that is because uh, modeling studies have shown that only part of the genes that uh, cause uh, uh, attention problems and hyperactivity overlap with each other. So what she found indeed was that this uh, uh, joint group of genes, of pathways, was involved in uh, increasing, increasing your risk for hyperactive symptoms, but not inattentive symptoms. And this was confirmed in an analysis uh, using a different rater in which we, we uh, looked at quantitative scores for hyperactivity and uh, inattentiveness, and there the same result was also found. When she disassembled the different pathways, she found that all of them contributed individually 
to, uh, to this association, so all of them were involved. And by um, integrating them or integrating the genes within the pathways, we get more power to analyze genetic association. So this was a study in 900 individuals, whereas um, uh, for the genome-wide association studies, we need tens of thousands. So can we use this information to improve the diagnostics um, of patients with a psychiatric disorder? Well, that is a region of, of uh, uh, research where there is a lot of development at the moment. We know that we can use these data to ma make personal risk profiles, but for that we need much more genetic information from the, uh, from the different psychiatric disorders and also the possibility to distinguish between them. So far, even with, with 100 independent hits, we um, can only explain 10 to 15 percent of the heritability of a psychiatric disorder like schizophrenia. So we're not there yet there, but this is definitely a field where more research is required and that can lead to the use of genetics in, um, in the clinic, which is our ultimate goal. So is there something else? Is there the possibility that other models underlie um, the occurrence of psychiatric di disorders? And people have been working on that, trying to find whether there is Mendelian forms of psychiatric disease. And there are families where you, you could think that this is really the case. And I've also looked into the possibility that there are genetic variants that uh, have a, give you a higher risk individually, so that you would need, only need two or three, perhaps, instead of, of like 100 of them. And the first results on this, uh, um, uh, from this field were surely the rare copy number variation studies where people looked at copy number variants, which are large genetic variants that encompass entire genes. And you can have, for example, so normally you would have two copies of a gene. And from these copy number variants, you can e either have one or zero, or you can have three, four, five, etc. And from all the different psychiatric uh, disorders, there is evidence for all the, these uh, disorders. There is now evidence that these indeed there is an enrichment of uh, rare copy number variants in psychiatric disease. So if there is really um, copy number variants involved, then people are also thinking that other types of more rare uh, genetic variants in the genome, human genome can be involved in psychiatric disorders. And this is a field where next generation sequencing, so the sequencing possibilities that we now get for, uh, for sequencing the entire genetic information in instead of genotyping just a million of the three billion base pairs, for example, is uh, uh, moving fast and, and helping us to find new genetic risk factors for uh, psychiatric disease. And there are now um, a number of papers out already on autism where people have been trying to make sense of uh, uh, next generation sequencing data, which give you huge data sets, so this is really big data science, um, which show that about 10% of autism spectrum uh, disorder cases might be explained by rare genetic variants that you can find with exome sequencing. So exome sequencing is um, using or sequencing the information that is in the coding part of the human genome. The coding part of the human genome is 3 to 5 percent of the entire human genome. And we concentrate on this part because we can understand it. We can see, well, is there a protein formed? Is this protein non-functional because of a, an amino acid change? Is it expressed differently? If we look at the entire uh, genome, there's so much so-called junk that we don't know uh, what its function is that we cannot inter interpret the data at, at the current time. So many of us are focusing on exomes. Well, also in ADHD, we have some nice examples that would lend themselves um, definitely for, for next generation sequencing. Like, for example, look at this family where you have a clear segregation of ADHD through the family and where you would say, well, one gene, one genetic defect should be enough to cause, uh, to cause such a uh, segregation pattern. But still, we do this type of 
analysis. We have now eight different families where we uh, did exome sequencing of, on three to five individuals, but in none of them we find one single variant segregating through the, um, through the family with, with the disease. So the models that we need to, um, to analyze these data with are not the Mendelian models that are used in, in monogenic disorders where only one single genetic defect is enough to cause uh, uh, a phenotype. And the ana analysis of uh, exome sequencing data or next generation sequencing data in complex diseases is a very active field of research at the moment. And they're, they're, well, the models for monogenic disorders won't fit, so we have to find new models and everybody's struggling with that, and we're, we're setting up a unit to do this type of analysis. And if you're still looking for a postdoc position and are interested in this, please come and see me. <laughs> we're very interested. So in general, um, when you think about identification of underlying genetic factors for psychiatric disorders, I guess we're, we're doing quite well. We at least have the tools now in hand to do this type of analysis. What we do with the data is a different uh, thing. We, we, the interpretation of data is really what is the bottleneck. But we're moving, we're moving further. With regard to the mapping of the biology from gene to disease, that is, that is a, different, uh, a totally different thing. And this is something we definitely need if we want to understand what is going on in psychiatric diseases and want to um, develop treatments that really treat the causes and not only the sy symptoms of these diseases. And I want to show you two approaches that are used to map pathways. And one is what I call bioinformatics, but this is really um, just in silico analysis of data that is already out there and that might be useful. So um, what we did, and this is work of uh, a PhD student, now a postdoc in my group, Geert Poemans, who has been looking, who has been taking the, the genome-wide association data that are out there, in this case for ADHD, and looked, even though he didn't, we didn't find uh, genome-wide significant data, whether there is something that makes sense, something that converges in these data. So what he did was he selected uh, genetic variants or genes that had a, a p-value, a study-specific p-value of uh, five ten, uh, or ten, um, uh, 10 to the minus 5, sorry, and, and smaller. And he looked at different softwares that uh, tell you about enrichment of um, uh, genetic functions in biological processes. What he found during this analysis is that many of these um, uh, softwares that you can use are very incomplete, so that when you do uh, a systematic literature review, you end up with much, much more information. And I understand that yesterday there was a, uh, a workshop on data mining. I think this is also a point where data mining or oh, text mining is, is something that, that can be improved to make these um, uh, softwares much more efficient. So he selected 85 genes. Um, from the different genome-wide association studies and actually found that half of them were, were, could be involved in a process called NORAD outgrowth. And he, he put this into a network, and this is not a network as you see it in, 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 in general uh, network science, but it just puts all the genes and, or proteins that are involved in NORAD outgrowth into a growth cone of a developing neuron. And you have different processes here, like sensing the environment, uh, uh, changing the cytoskeleton, changing the extracellular matrix, changing the, the uh, transcription and translation, so the gene regulation within uh, this, this growing neuron to make the, the, the neuride grow out into a certain direction. So for ADHD, it gave us a new process to focus on, new biological process to focus on, on um, in understanding what ADHD actually is. He has also built networks 
for, um, for autism. And these networks are based on much more data than we have for ADHD. So there's exome data, exome sequencing data for autism already around. There's much more GWAS data, etc. So he, what he found here was that uh, three different processes could be um, found to be involved and enriched in the data. But what, what is most important is that um, with these data, he found sort of hubs within the networks and also between the networks that make excellent candidates for, uh, for new leads for treatment development. And this is, I think, the, the strength of this um, uh, network approach or this yeah, enrichment approach that we can really find new targets to, to, to turn to when we think about innovation of treatment. And this makes this, uh, for me, makes this very interesting. And, and rather, yeah, uh, a, sh a shorter term from understanding biology to going into um, treatment development than I would have thought myself. So another approach to, um, to understand what is going on when you have a genetic variant and, you, you, uh, um, and how it leads to, to increased disease risk is cognomics. And cognomics stands for cognition genomics and actually um, is a science that tries to map the, genetic, the effects of genetic variants on a behavior through the, through, via the brain. So when I talked to somebody this morning, uh, she said that uh, geneticists tend to see the organism as a black box. And I hope that this can assure you that we're not treating the organism or seeing the organism as a black box. We're very well aware that there are things between the gene and the disease that uh, are worth looking at. So when you think about uh, a genetic variant, how it can affect uh, your phenotype, your behavioral phenotype, it probably alters, together with other genes, alters gene function, uh, or cell function, sorry, and then uh, has an, why, that, why this way has, a, has an effect on the morphology and or the function of the brain. And together with other uh, genetic variants doing the same thing, you end up with an effect on behavior. So integrating these data towards uh, disease symptoms. <clears throat> so when you uh, think about to explain these pathways, one, one place to look at is really brain morphology and brain function. And that is what I want to show you in the next few, few slides. In Nijmegen, we uh, set up the cognomics program um, in which we now have data on more than 3,600 individuals. And um, cognomics really is a, an umbrella um, across a number of dif different studies, including the brain imaging genetic study, which is a study on healthy individuals, uh, from which we have mainly structural data um, uh, of the brain. Then the impact and L study, which is the, the Dutch part of the uh, international multicenter uh, study for persistent ADHD. So these are adults with ADHD, and there is neuroimage, which is um, a study on child, children with ADHD. I want to show you one example from, from IMPACT, where uh, currently four PhD students are working, and within the, the international study, we are focusing on functional and structural neuroimaging in, in uh, these patients with adult ADHD. So what we do is we bring them in uh, on two days for an excessive um, analysis, both on the, the clinical phenotypes, the neuropsychology, uh, imaging data uh, we get from them, and also genetic data. Martina Hochmann is one of the PhD students, former PhD students, I have to say, and she uh, did a study using one of the um, uh, uh, candidate genes for ADHD called nitric oxide synthase 1 or coding for nitric oxide synthase 1, which is known uh, to have an effect on striatal activity and impulsivity. So NOS1 is a candidate uh, for ADHD, both from candidate gene-based uh, studies and from the genome-wide association studies, and it is known to be highly expressed in the striatum. For ADHD, the striatum is, is an important structure. It is involved in reward and impulsivity and is known to be hypoactivated um, uh, in uh, patients with ADHD. 
So Martina used a task called the Modified uh, Monetary Incentive Task, task uh, also in the Knudsen task, um, where people were in the scanner were told that um, they had to click on a button as soon as they saw a target, a white circle, but before they saw the target, they were informed whether or not they can earn a reward, so a monetary reward, um, uh, by pressing as soon as possible. And the, she then looked at the contrast of reward over no reward. What you see then is a robust activation of the ventral striatum, and um, Martina could um, replicate earlier literature, indeed showing that ADHD patients have a lower activation um, due to reward than uh, healthy individuals have. But when she looked at the effect of a genetic factor known to be involved in ADHD, so NOS1, where the SS genotype is the risk factor for ADHD, she saw actually the, the opposite. So those with, AD, uh, with the, the SS genotype actually had a stronger activity in the striatum than those without. And this was the case both in the affected individuals and in the healthy controls. So we were quite puzzled by that, but then we used another task for impulsivity, the delay discounting task, which is a, a, a behavioral task, and we analyzed it in a behavioral way. Um, and there we, show, we saw actually the same. So here, the more impulsive you are, the lower um, the bar is that you see. And here, especially the, the uh, patients with the risk factor had a much lower activity than those without the risk factor. The same was true also for the controls, but this didn't reach uh, significance. So what this told us was that NOS1 was not actually tagging ADHD, but was tagging impulsivity. And this very well um, uh, correlates or is in concordance with a paper showing that uh, this NOS1 variant is actually not only a risk factor for ADHD, but for different impulsive behaviors in humans. So it tells us that the, the effects of genes can be quite um, uh, indirect, affecting traits that uh, feed into the disease rather than the disease itself. <clears throat> so. Um, this was an example from the function of, of a brain unit. We can also look at morphology of the brain unit. And I already told you about the brain imaging genetic study, where we now have 2,500 individuals included. Um, these are healthy individuals. Most of them are, are healthy young adults. Most of them are also students from our uh, own university who come to do uh, our experiments. And what we find there is indeed that we can find um, uh, effects on specific brain regions due to genetic risk factors for disease. And this is a study of BDNF, which is a risk factor for depression, so not ADHD in this case. And uh, we were able to show that this has an effect on the anterior cingulate cortex volume in the healthy individuals. But it only has this effect when there is also in, an environmental factor present that also is a risk factor for, for depression namely childhood adversity. So the people in big are scanned um, at different um, uh, field strength. Some of them are scanned at 1.5 Tesla, others at uh, 3 Tesla, and we were able to replicate our findings um, both at 1.5 and 3 Tesla. So also on the on brain structure, you see effects of uh, individual genes that feed into disease risk. In BIG, we can do candidate gene studies, but we also want to do um, genome-wide studies on looking at effects of genes on brain structure. And if you want to do that, you need international networks again. And for that reason, um, uh, in, I think it was in 2010, Paul Thompson and Nick Martin uh, founded the Enhancing Neuroim Neuroimaging Genetics Through Meta-Analysis Consortium, or the Enigma Consortium. We became one of the first members and uh, part of the uh, central support group of Enigma. And the first Enigma project that we did together uh, with a lot of, of different people was uh, to ask the question, which genes contribute to hippocampus volume and to measures, different measures of total brain volume. 
So the way Enigma works is not uh, by asking everybody to give us their data and doing the analysis across the entire data. We're using a crowdsourcing uh, method in, in Enigma to, to get uh, to our results. So what we do is that the, the Enigma support team writes protocols and tests these protocols, and these protocols are for uh, both the, the segmentation of the brain, and this uses um, uh, things like FreeSurfer and Episode First, um, but also for the imputation of genetic data and how to do the association studies. Then every group can perform their analysis on their own sample by themselves at their own centers, so no need to share the data, which is often a problem because of ethical approval, etc. And the Enigma support uh, team only collects the summary data, uh, does an extensive QC on them, and then performs meta-analysis. The first Enigma study in this way uh, brought together more than 13,000 uh, uh, data on more than 13,000 uh, samples from I think uh, up to 20 different uh, groups. And we indeed found effects um, of genetic variants on brain structure. So we found one, gen uh, one uh, genetic variant being significant, so causing or, or passing the threshold of 5 times 10 to the minus uh, 8 uh, for hippocampus volume and one for intracranial volume. <coughs> We replicated our data in another consortium, the CHARGE consortium, which added another 10,000 individuals to this analysis, and we ended up with p-values of uh, 6 times 10 to the minus 16, which is very nice. Interestingly, the um, uh, genetic variant associated with intracranial volume was also associated with IQ. So there is a link between uh, brain volume, again a link between brain volume, and uh, um, behavior. And that is the, the most interesting thing for me in this analysis. Well, Enigma, this is to show you that uh, Enigma um, not only wants to do the analyses, they also want to um, have people use the analyses. So we, we have a website where we um, uh, have all the protocols that you can use, and we also have um, a tool where you can look up the genetic effects, so you can put in either a gene name or a, a genetic variant name, and it will tell you whether, what the p-value was for association with hippocampus or intracranial volume. We're now putting together a new project which will not only look at um, uh, hippocampus and uh, intracranial volume, but will look at all the different subcortical uh, brain regions, and this currently has a, a total of 18,000 participants or samples involved. As I said, the interesting thing for me to look at is really um, whether these genes that we found, find for brain structure also have an effect on behavior and uh, uh, behavioral abnormalities in this case, like that we find them in psychiatric disease. And in this, um, uh, to answer, answer this question, we are making use of the strength of Enigma and trying to combine it with the strength of another consortium, the Psychiatric GWAS consortium that I told you uh, about before. So we're trying to meta-analyze and to, to link the data from PGC uh, and Enigma and trying to find out whether there's overlap between the, uh, the uh, genes for hippocampus volume, for example, and schizophrenia. And this is currently ongoing, and we're going to start the analysis within the next month. So if I have to put out, uh, uh, say, where um, uh, data, or data analysis and, and uh, data handling can still be improved, then it is definitely in a region where we uh, combine brain region, data on multiple brain regions with data on multiple genes. So what I've been showing you is that we can use candidate brain regions and um, uh, integrate an, an data on multiple genes with them. We also can do it the other way around. We can use a candidate gene and look at multiple brain regions, but we cannot yet do this um, uh, combination because the dimensionality of the data really gets prohibiting. So this is an area where there's, there will be a lot of, of I foresee a lot of development um, needed 
in uh, a method development. So looking back, what can we say about where we are with, in terms of our ultimate goal of research? Well, we have, still have to go quite some uh, way to identify all the underlying genetic factors that are involved in psychiatric diseases. Um, we need to optimize multivariate methods or use um, multivariate methods to maximize the power of our analyses. We need to generate personal risk profiles to be able to use them in the diagnosis and we have to make next generation sequencing work for uh, complex disorders. On the side of the mapping of the biology from gene to disease, um, we need more complete databases for in silico analysis, so the bioinformatics tools that are around there, uh, pathway um, uh, software is too incomplete currently to, to answer our questions. Also, something that I haven't shown you in this presentation is that we need affordable model systems to really, where, 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 um, where we don't have any data yet, we need to generate data, and we can do that only in um, model systems that are affordable, fast, and flexible. And my own group is currently doing analyses of ADHD in fruit flies, Drosophila, and this actually works quite fine. So if you knock out a gene that gives uh, humans AD or that increases the risk for ADHD in humans, it will also make your fly hyperactive. Last but not least, uh, multivariate analysis methods for cognomics research is also something that is dearly needed. So I was faster than I thought I was, because this is already, <laughs> you didn't need your five minutes slide, Eve. <laughs> This is where I want to thank a number of people. Um, of course, the, number, the list of, of people who are involved in these large-scale uh, projects is, is huge. So I'm putting here those of the Enigma support group, um, the cognomics people, and the PGC participants that are, play a role in the um, uh, analysis of both the Enigma and the uh, PGC data together. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, so thanks for an interesting talk. I, I wonder about this, um, this, this different psychiatric uh, disorders. Do you expect that like s some genes are involved in many of them, so, and that can give you some help in uh, like more statistical power in your analysis? Yeah, yeah. So the, what the psychiatric GWAS consortium has also done is, is a quite agnostic uh, analysis where they just put everything together that that had a disease. So everybody. Uh, whether they had uh, schizophrenia or ADHD or autism, they put them all into the patient group and compared them to controls. And indeed, in these analyses, a number of genes pop up that give you an intrinsic susceptibility to psychiatric disease. Of course, that makes your power, that improves your power to, analyse, to, to uh, perform the analysis, but it um, reduces your your ability to use genetics in uh, diagnosis because the specificity is just lacking. So what we see more and more is that um, the clinical defi definitions of psychiatric disease are not very well related to biology. So what I foresee is that within five years we will have to look at, at, uh, at these psychiatric definitions again and try to come up with a um, categorization that is more biology based. Yeah. Oh. Hi, thanks for the talk, that was great. Um, I've got two questions. I mean, one is on the data sharing aspect. I mean, it's mm. great to do a meta analysis, but uh, it would be even better to, to be able to share the data. And you, you mentioned that there, was, there are ethical problems, and, uh, but uh, it is also kind of non-ethical to not try to share the data in the sense that you, with the, all the data around, we could uh, you know, advance more, much quicker in, the, in those disease uh, identifications. So what do you think are the path, uh, the path for, for actually you know, being able to, with you know, the appropriate informed consent and things like that, you know, be able mm. to actually share the data as, as, almost as a moral obligation somehow? Yep. So that was my first question. And the second one is, 
there are a couple of multivariate analyses on you know uh, brain versus uh, genetic uh, multivariate analysis um, uh, in the literature. Why are not they used more? Is that a software problem? Is that an interpretation problem? Hmm. Okay, so with regard to, to the data sharing, I, I agree entirely that a, um, sharing of primary data will increase the possibilities that you can, uh, of, of the ways in which you can use these data. So already with, with Enigma and PGC now, we are definitely limited in what we can do, what the, the approaches we, what approaches we can use to combine these data with each other. So that there, there is definitely a point in um, improving this and getting people to really share the primary data. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, in terms of getting the field forward, this was the best way. Because that makes um, the threshold for people to share or to participate in these analyses much, much uh, lower. But I, I agree definitely that we need to, to come to a model where people really share. And there are also, I know, uh, for example, at MRN, there, there are um, uh, preparing software in which you don't really need to um, place your data at a different site, but analyses can be done uh, remotely on your data. So that is another model that might also work for, for this type of data sharing keeping the data in the place where you want them or where, where you need to have them and having other people trying to do data analysis on them. With regard to the multivariate analysis, you are right. There is, um, there is a number of methods now coming available to do this type of analysis and indeed the interpretation of the data is much more of a problem than finding the new methods. But still, this this is still a problem that we need to solve. Yeah. It's a very nice talk. Thank you very much. Uh, with regard to the disease description, do you think there is a possibility that we could throw away DSM-5 <laughs> or DSM-4 and see if we could find a way where the 29, 35, 50,000 patients uh, could express their own disease. Hmm. So starting from the data instead of the categorizations. It's a very good point. Um, um, I think that is the way to go, definitely. Uh, on the other hand, the, the, the input data is, is a little bit of a problem because they were collected using these categories. So you don't see the entire spectrum, probably. That, that makes it a little bit more difficult, but it's a good way to go to, to start from the data, yeah. yeah. More task load for the neuroinformaticians. 